How deep is deep seek? Chinese AI company DeepSeek has Silicon Valley marveling at how its programmers nearly matched American rivals despite using inferior chips, the Wall Street Journal reported on Monday. AI models from DeepSeek, the Chinese company, have zoomed to the global top 10 in performance according to popular ranking. I've used it myself and I'm not able to give a official or a professional view, but it's pretty interesting and it's also a little difficult to get into because I guess of the huge rush to sign up. On Jan 20th, DeepSeek introduced R1, a specialized model designed for complex problem solving. DeepSeek's advances sparked a sell-off led by chip shares early on Monday on concerns that the huge spending by these big tech giants on leading edge semiconductor and other AI infrastructure was justified. So the concerns were whether this spending was justified. So what does DeepSeek mean and how does such an option even emerge? I spoke with Jaspreet Bindra, founder and managing director of Tech Whisperer, a consultant in digital transformation and AI and earlier group chief digital officer with the Mahindra Group. I began by asking him how much of a surprise DeepSeek was. I think it definitely has been a surprise for everyone. Though now a few experts and pundits are claiming that they did see it earlier and are and did talk about it. I think the fact that China is not too far away from the U.S. was not a surprise. But the fact that they were like this far ahead and looking at costs which were less than 3% of the costs that the Valley companies are building models at was a super big surprise. And I think you'll see the effect of it when the markets open in a few hours' time. Got it. And in a general sense, why is it or how is it to the extent that a layperson could understand that the costs are so dramatically different in the way the Silicon Valley has done it or scoped it versus how this particular Chinese company has done it? I think in many ways, the U.S.'s efforts to keep China a distant second in the race by the whole chips ban, the semiconductors ban, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has come back to bite it. What happened was that while the U.S. companies were working with tens of billions of dollars available, the Chinese companies were starved of resources, starved of chips, starved of compute power. And as we all know, and we know this well in India, that necessity is the mother of invention. And so, you know, I think they just approached this entirely fresh, built upon some of the stuff that already had come out in the valley. So, for example, DeepSeek, and specifically in this case, is not trained on the raw data of the internet, which is what, you know, Chat GPT or Gemini, etc. were trained on and therefore required this huge computing power, billions of dollars, many, many months to get the models right. These guys used a new technique which people are discovering called distillation, which basically takes Chat GPT and the results that gives and builds on top of that. So much like in many other technologies, you're building on top of stuff which has already been done. And I think this is part of the secret sauce. I'm sure there are others which we still don't know about. You know, the fact that they've been able to juice out more power from cheaper last generation chips. The fact that they've used young, very bright, but very hungry engineers to make this happen are all parts of the mix. I'm sure there's other stuff too. Right. And, you know, so people are saying that the entire chain of AI investments is now looking questionable, which includes obviously the hardware side of it. So how does that play out? Because, you know, even in India, we're talking about these giant data centers where we want to spend billions of dollars, which we would have typically spent on those very chips to do the same kind of computing that we think will be done. It's an interesting question and it can play out both ways, frankly, uh, going because now, if you think of the two main kind of companies or three main kind of companies, they're the big techs like Microsoft, Google, etc. Now, while they've committed to invest $80 billion, $60 billion, etc., if they discover a way where they can have AI much more cheaply to deliver to their customers, they'll be net gainers. They're not as much in the AI game as they are in delivering AI-infused services to their end customers. So, in the medium to long term, this could actually be a gain for them. Number two is obviously the infrastructure guys like NVIDIA. Okay, and there it gets more interesting. I think NVIDIA will fall the hardest immediately. But again, if instead of five people building AI and spending $50 billion with it, with buying those chips, if suddenly because of this AI model production gets democratized and 100,000 people can build small models, 
they will still need GPUs, semiconductors, chips from companies like Anvidia. And so you could look at a scenario where there are more customers, less chips per customer. What, however, is interesting to conclude is the third constituency, which are, you know, these big startups now like OpenAI, you know, which have been spending so much money to build these chips. They clearly will have to go in a different direction. And I think at OpenAI, they must be having these war rooms right now. I know Meta has. There are four war rooms which have been formed at Meta right now, you know, to figure out what is the direction that they go in. All of this seems so far away from how things were looking just a week ago. But let me come to the other question which has been raised. This is open source. And I'd like to use this to ask you two questions. I mean, about open source in general? And what does open source in this context mean versus, let's say, open AI, the proper noun, and open source in, I guess, the common noun? <laughs> there have been many surprises about DeepSea. The cost, obviously, is one surprise. The kind of chips used is another surprise. The fact that China came out and did it is a third surprise. Okay, and I think the fourth big surprise is that this was all open sourced and the company has published a technical paper on it, which is a full disclosure paper. The kind of papers that almost no Western company has published. So it's a full disclosure. They kind of give out the tech specs. They tell exactly what the weights in the model are so that anyone can take it and, you know, build on it. In a sense, it's a Trojan horse approach because obviously all developers would want to build on, you know, the cheapest model and this is by far the cheapest. And so, you know, this model will become the basis of all AI rather than an open AI model becoming the basis of all AI. And so I think the open source part is important, one, for this reason. And the second is that in technology, it's always a closed source, open source battle. And we know that that played out in IT, you know, with Microsoft and the whole Wintel and then the open source Unix and others. And then, you know, even in the Apple iOS versus the Android kind of ecosystems, and I think the same thing will play out now in the closed source versus open source. And at least history tells us that both continue to coexist. You know, the open source has certain benefits and closed source has certain other benefits. But if I may conclude by saying that, I think what has happened is that usually open source takes much longer to catch up. Okay, in this case, especially with DeepSeek, even Meta's Llama open source models, they were like semi-open source, were still reasonably behind in a... GPT class models like ChatGPT or Gemini. But this has narrowed the gap considerably very fast at super low cost and so it's caught up much faster. Got it. And last question. So does India benefit? Can India benefit? How should we be looking at this development? Well, my argument and hope is that while this is an existentialist threat for many companies, countries in the West, Indians should be elated by this development despite our antipathy towards China. I mean, if you follow the sector, there's always been this debate between whether India should make its own large language models or not, you know, and everyone has weighed in. And the main barriers to building India-specific, India context, India language and large language models has really been the cost. You know, it's been the compute cost, the cost of talent, the cost of data, etc. And now suddenly that is a myth, you know, that shibboleth has been broken. And so I think it gives an opportunity for India to build its own, not one, but multiple large language models. And secondly, it's great for uh, startups and developers. If they were paying, you know, what they were paying an open AI or equivalent for their APIs, now they can potentially get it for, you know, uh, cents to the dollar and therefore create much cheaper products at lower cost. So I think for both these reasons, it's good for India if we grasp the opportunity. Good note to end on. Jaspreet, thank you so much for joining me. Great. Good to be here. Thank you.